Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. All right, thank you. Uh, welcome to Prime Time at the BU Library. Uh, Prime Time is a collaborative project between friends of the BU Library, faculty development, and many of the offices on campus that celebrates learning beyond the classroom with the experiences and accomplishments of the faculty, students, and staff. Presentations are recorded and are available at the BU Digital Library, which can be found on the library's homepage. Want to know who's presenting this spring? You can see what's coming up on the library's event page or on the Bethel calendar on link. Join us on Thursday, March 26th, as we welcome Sarah Budenhoff and Rachel McAdams for an international study abroad spotlight about their experiences in Spain and Chile. Today, we welcome Dr. Kate Bonowitz, Associate Professor of Education, and Professor Rebecca Seberg, Assistant Professor of Math and Computer Science, who will share about their separate experiences exploring the Finnish education system. Let's welcome them this morning. My name is, I'm going to include my, my maiden name in here because that's the whole point of me going to Finland. <laughs> my name is Katie Reisenen Bonowitz. And uh, I had the opportunity to spend my sabbatical fall 2013 uh, throughout the country of Finland. Hey, tomorrow. Uh, okay, put back to <laughs> I'll get back to the wood now. Um, yeah, I went to both Finland and Sweden, so I'll describe that a little bit more in a few minutes. And uh, I did this for my sabbatical the spring of 2013. All right, and we're going to go back and forth this morning uh, throughout our experiences, and, and some of our experiences really um, uh, work off of each other very nicely, and some were very different. So I'm going to start us off with why I chose going to Finland. Um, so personally, all four of my grandparents were born in Finland, and I had a strong desire to know more about where they grew up. And also, uh, the Finnish education system has been number one in the world a few years back, and it's still in the top 10 across the world. I wanted to explore and find out why Finland? Why is Finland up there along with, uh, with um, no, this is, uh, Korea? And why is it up there with China and some of our Asian countries? Because they have very different methods of teaching. So that was my purpose in, in heading there. Um, and it was the perfect fit because I'm an education professor and I'm Finnish. So. <laughs> So I love this picture. My mother gave me this picture when I graduated as a teacher. And this is my grandfather right here, Nels Reisenen. And he came to America um, in 1909 when he was 19 years old. And he didn't speak English. And so he figured, I'm going to go to school with second graders so that I can learn the English language. And I figure it's a great picture of what English as a second language looked like in the 1900s. So my journey through Finland, I really had the um, wonderful opportunity to start at the Arctic Circle in uh, Rovaniemi, and I worked closely with the University of Lapland and one of their lab schools. So I was able to spend time there. Um, then I went to Thaivakoski, which is here. This is where my grandfather on the Ryzen inside, grandfather and grandmother were born. And I spent time in a little country school there. It's called Hutunkolu and it had only 62 children in it, K-6, and it was a fabulous way to see present-day education in a very small, um, secluded area. Then to Gusamo, which is very near the Russian border, that is where all of my Tormanen side, on my mother's side, they were born, and that school was a large school, um, uh, several thousand kids, um, but in northern Finland. Then I went to Oulu, to a very urban school, um, quite diverse, 25% uh, diversity in that school, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then down to Kokola, which is right on the west coast, and that was an English-Swedish immersion school. And then I went, and these are all elementary schools, and then Helsinki at the Ruhalati school, and I also had time in the Department of Education at the University of Helsinki. Okay, so back to me for a few minutes. Um, I needed a sabbatical project as well, and I had read about Finland, and um, thought, you know, this sounded interesting. Actually, when I first mentioned to my husband that I'm going to go have a sabbatical, he said, well, you ought to travel. And I hadn't really even thought about traveling, because that's expensive, and where would I go? And 
So then I put that together with um, what I knew about Finland and thought, well, maybe that's what I should do. Um, I also have Swedish ancestry, not Finnish, and I know some educator friends in Sweden. And the interesting thing is that Sweden is very much like Finland. Of course, there's differences as well. Their educational system is quite similar in, in many of the structural ways. And yet, their results are more like us. And so what's the you know, reason for this interesting um, relationships between Finland and Sweden, and yet between Sweden and us in terms of results? So I, and then I, what I did was I focused on math education, and mainly secondary level, um, Katie mainly elementary. So that's why we have a few different things that we can share. I guess I'm going to let you get this one. So this shows where I went. I didn't go into very many places in Finland because I had one uh, main spot that I could stay for free, which was great, um, which was in Benta, Finland. And I visited a school there. And then the rest of the schools that I visited were either in Helsinki or in communities very close, like suburban areas close by. Um, and I spent two weeks there uh, visiting it was either six or seven schools and visiting math classrooms. I also met with someone in the um, education department at the University of Helsinki in math education and discussed things with him that I had read about. And then I didn't actually take this route. I couldn't make the map quest do it quite right to have me fly that <laughs> over. It would have been fun to take the ferry, but it would have taken more time and I didn't. So I flew to Stockholm. My friend from Lindisberry picked me up. And she's a principal at a school there. And I spent a week in their school. And then I spent a week down in Hampshire shipping at a school also. And actually, we have a Bethel Seminary student from Sweden. She's going to graduate this spring. And her parents live in Hampshire shipping. So that was my connection from others in education. Oh, I had to stick a Swedish flag up there just to <laughs> well, equal flag time. <laughs> OK. So some key principles in the Finnish schools, um, and both uh, Becky and I referenced Dr. Kasi Salberg, and I say Salberg because mine is Finnish, and she'll probably say Kasi Salberg, because uh, he's actually Swedish. He's just been in the, um, he does all of his work in Finland and is now at Harvard um, University. So University of Harvard, sorry. Um, a lot of what Dr. Kasi Salberg talked about was what I wanted to, to actually see in the Finnish schools. Was this actually happening? So he focuses on, he talks about Finland focusing on collaboration, not competition. And that was evident in every school, every classroom I went into, not just with the teachers. They weren't competing against each other. Schools weren't competing for higher scores. Um, but also in the classrooms, the children, everything that they do was collaborative. A lot of problem, problem solving approaches and many opportunities to collaborate with one another. Personalization, not standardization. I saw this and observed this in many different factors in ability of the students, the languages, and the religion. And I'll talk a little bit more about how language and religion plays a role in every week of the um, Finnish school, of this Finnish school day. Trust-based responsibility, not test-based accountability. And I know um, Becky's going to talk more on the assessment piece, but it was amazing to observe how trusted and respected teachers are in Finland. They are above doctors and lawyers in Finland. It is more difficult to get into university if you want to become a teacher versus if you want to be a doctor or a lawyer. We know that's not the case in our country. Um, Equity, not school choice. So everyone in Finland has the opportunity to go to school, um, starting at um, birth all the way through the doctorate level. It's all free. It's a socialist country, so we get where the money comes from. But um, it's amazing to see because the, the, the moms who choose to stay at home with their kids because they get tons of um, maternity leave, it's many years worth. But their children have access to activities in the schools, even if they're staying home with their children. Um, preschool and kindergarten, and less than 2% of children in Finland are in private schools. Education as a human right, not education as an industry, and I already touched on this, pre-K through college is free. 
we could even go there and get education for free if we wanted to. <laughs> So Katie already mentioned a little bit this, um, the competition to get into a teacher education program and they really only take the top 10%. So you get the respect element right away there. That we know that anyone who's gotten into this program is one of the best students that's come through um, the lower grades. And um, this of course also, I mean, it's hard because you wonder, well how can we change that here? It's just there's so many things that play into this that are interrelated that it would be it's difficult to think, well, how can we suddenly change things here? But people actually really want to be teachers because of this. It's, it's hard to get into. It's well respected. Um, then it's not only hard to get into, but it's, it's more work to get out of. You have to have a master's degree to become a teacher. You can't just have a bachelor's degree. Can I add to the master's degree component? When the um, teachers are, are working towards their master's degree, already at that student um, teacher preparation phase, when what we would call student teaching, they are already doing research at that level. And so before they finish with their master's degree, they've had an opportunity to um, use their, to practice and gather their research and implement it and see how it's working. So um, especially the lab schools that I visited, it was amazing to see the collaboration between the university and the school and how all of that was working to benefit all of the children in attendance. Well, and for any secondary teacher, which includes lower secondary and upper secondary, it's a master's degree in their subject, not in education. The elementary teachers, it's in education. So that lends to this view of these people as experts expert teachers in their subject. And I also noted that almost, well, basically every math teacher I met in secondary also taught science or computer science. So they were capable in more than one subject. And that, they told me, well, we wouldn't get a job if that weren't the case. So you have to be that, uh, have that ability. On autonomy in classrooms, the teachers really have the authority to choose, there's a core curriculum, but they can, are, they are trusted um, and have the ability to choose how they're going to teach their material. And there are, uh, in, I know in, at least in the math curriculum, there are standard uh, math textbooks that everyone uses, but then they can you know, do what they, with what they wish with that. Um, the pay is also much better for um, teachers in Finland, they are paid 92% of what other college educator workers make, whereas in the U.S. that's less than 60%, and this is also similar in Sweden, the pay is not as good as in Finland. And this was a quote, was this yeah, a I, quote? So I had attended three different presentations with Dr. Salberg prior to going to Finland, and there was always somebody who would ask the question, what do you do with the bad teachers? because they kept talking about all these amazing teachers that there has to be some that don't make it. And this particular woman who ended up hosting me at her school, she said, bad teachers, what are those? <laughs> you know? And really what they, what they shared with me, and I said, no, really. Like, I'm sure in 20 years time you've had a bad teacher. And they said what, end up, what ends up happening is they really come, or eat, their colleagues come around them and support them. And, and ultimately what they find out is if they are a poor teacher, they end up leaving the profession because they're not happy. And they're surrounded by so much support and people who are willing to help them grow that if they don't want to grow, they, they basically, you know, probably, they're not bullied out of the system, but, but I'm sure there's the pressure of, I'm really not cutting it. I, I better just go and do something different. So it was very fascinating that every conference I attended with them, somebody asked that question. Well, I can add one thing there. I visited one school that was an English-speaking school. Um, in Finland, they have English-speaking schools, Swedish-speaking schools, and Finnish-speaking schools. And I mostly observed at Swedish-speaking schools because I can understand, especially if it's math, the Swedish. Um, and I can speak a little bit of it. So the Finnish, I know nothing, and so that would have been more challenging. But that's the same education they're getting. Um, at the English school, there were a couple American teachers teaching there, and I got to talk to them, and that was interesting. They said, 
they had taught in the U.S. as well, and they said it's so different here because the teachers here really want to teach. That it's like it's their really their goal and their life um, to teach. Whereas they remembered some American teachers that well maybe they're teaching because they really want to coach football um, or something like that, or it's, they couldn't get something else, so they decided to teach. And um, there's no such thing as sports in the schools there, so you don't have football coaches um, in the schools. It's, they're just teaching. And I know both Becky and I would agree, we know that all of our students who finish at Bethel are the best teachers <laughs> in the schools. So we're not denying that at all. Uh, here's a matrix of the formal education in Finland so you can get a sense of what does their um, we have a K-12 system here. What does their system look like? So here the basic education is starts at age 7 and goes through age 16. So um, nine years worth of school at um, in the comprehensive schools, they call it. You can see down here there is pre-primary education, and everyone has access to that for free, as I referenced earlier, but not everyone takes part in it. The majority of students do. Then beyond that year nine, um, students will choose which path they want to go for education. And what I, what I so appreciate about Finland's system is that you're not locked into whatever step you choose. So if I'm 16 years old and I'm not really sure if I want to go in, on to university, maybe I didn't have the best scores um, in, my, in, the mo in ninth and eighth and ninth grade, and I'm not really sure if university is for me, I can choose a technical or a vocational um, pathway. But let's say I go through vocational for two years and I decide, you know what, I really do want to go and get my four-year degree. You can change and go a different path. Whereas in countries like Germany, at age 12, you, that's when your decision for your future is made. And so if you have a learning disability, for example, in Germany, you don't get to ever have a choice to go on to university. You have to choose a vocational route. At age 12, that decision is made. In Finland, you can continue to grow and change that pathway. And that was incredibly encouraging for me, especially as a special education professional, knowing that our students who might struggle and who haven't found that fit yet are going to have multiple opportunities to figure that out. And um, one other thing that um, I, I found out too that it, it's not really frowned upon is this takes more than three years. So right. it's, not, it's not quite the same here as like, oh, you didn't graduate from high school or it took you long or you failed or whatever. It's not really considered failing. You just are taking a longer time and that's okay. Um, just to point out the Swedish system, in case you're interested, because I also looked at it's very much the same as this, which is interesting. The one difference is right here, this upper secondary level. Um, it's still optional. That This is the compulsory education in Sweden, the nine years. But here they actually put these together. It's called the gymnasium. And the vocational choices are at every gymnasium. Some have different choices than others. And so students at this age already sometimes start traveling to another community and living there to go because they want to get the program in this community. This, and this typically is more vocational choices. Um, it's also, from what I observed, I didn't go to any of these situations because I was observing math classrooms in upper secondary, but um, everyone I went to here in Finland was very much like a, a United States high school, but although there were differences. In Sweden, it's more like a community college. So the students come and go. <clears throat> they kind of choose a path. The first couple of years, they do a lot of the same things, but they can still change from one plan to another. Because <clears throat> they're doing sort of like, at Bethel, you're doing your gen eds at the beginning. Um, but it's quite different from both the US and Finland in that it's more like a community college, and the vocational choices are right there. And then at, in Finland, the vocational options, I have a cousin who's a shop um, instructor and one who's an auto um, mechanics instructor, and those are definitely more like a community college. So even though you're only 17, 18, at this point, it is set up more like a community college where it's flexible schedules and um, coming and going as, as needed. 
So I'm going to give a little preview of the, I think, yeah, uh, of what the finished school days look like, and then Becky will do what her experience was, and then we'll have time. We'll try to leave about 10 minutes for questions. Uh, so a typical school day in the K-6 world in Finland is that they would call their teachers teacher, letter, and um, and or letteri. Sorry, I have German in my head right now, and and or their first name. Uh, here in Minnesota, most of our schools still say Mr. or Mrs. and whatever the name is. My favorite part about the Finnish school day is that after every 45-minute lesson, there is a required 15-minute break outside. And especially my half of special ed, and I know our kids with hyperactivity and kids with behaviors, they need time to just play. Um, and this is not a recommendation, this is a mandate by the government that this happens. And if you happen to have a 90 minute class period for some reason, then you have a 30 minute break outside. This is going to speak to the lunch experiences I had, and I have a picture coming up here in a little bit. Here in Minnesota, in, across the states, um, we have one formal recess per day unless teachers choose to bring their kids outside. Um, beyond that, but it's not really encouraged to do that. Recess is maybe 20 minutes if you're lucky to play outside. They go from 9 o'clock to 2 o'clock each day. They had a flexible schedule. Um, sometimes, so if it's a, um, for looking Monday through Friday, it might be that Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, they start at 9, but on Tuesdays they start at 8. Uh, the home that we, the family we lived with while we were there, my, my husband was with me, um, their daughter, who was eight, had a different bus schedule every single day of the week, and she was at that little country school. Um, so some days she'd get on the bus at eight, the next day it might be nine o'clock, so a very flexible schedule. 24 to 27 lessons per week, depending on the age. This generally, um, or in Minnesota, most of our schools have the same hours every day. Um, 27.5 hours per week is what our lessons look like. So you can see it's pretty similar as far as the lessons, even though they get tons of recess and playtime. They have 188 days per year, and in Minnesota we have 170 days per year. So even with the, the free time and all of that, they have more days, and their test scores are showing us tremendous uh, gains. So I'm going to give you a little photo journey. Um, I like to tell stories through photos. So reindeer, this was one of the reindeer I saw on the side of the road, but uh, when I was in northern Finland, driving to the school, we'd see anywhere from 10 to 30 reindeer just loping across the road. <laughs> it was amazing. They were beautiful. Suomi uh, Sukat, this was another part of my favorites um, in the schools. All of the children are in socks. So they take their shoes off when they get to school. This little sign is right at the, when you walk into the school, it says, stop. Take off your socks, um, or take off your shoes. I can't take off your shoes, yeah. And you can see here just all the fun little socks, stripes, and polka dots. <laughs> um, these students were heading to shop class, so they had to bring their shoes with them um, so that they didn't drop a hammer or something on their toes. Uh, the outdoor activities were just prevalent everywhere we went. And in the summer, everyone had a bicycle. Um, not in the summer, in the fall, everyone had a bicycle, and so before the school day began, they would go for a bike ride down the um, country pathway. And then in the winter, um, in Helsinki, the schools provide skis for everyone, and then most children have ice skates, but they had, the particular school I was at had 70 extra sets for those kids who did not have um, ice skates. Textiles, the hands-on components which I believe are so important for our students, um, start at age five. So at age five, they already start practicing with paper and yarn and uh, um, sewing machines. They're practicing how to stay on a line. You can see boys and girls are equal here. Um, they were creating, this group was creating scarves. Um, and no, that group was creating scarves. This group, I think, was doing um, little dishcloths. And then down there is where they're still practicing how to follow follow the lines. Um, but what's amazing is even into adulthood, um, Finlanders are always looking to do hands-on uh, hands textiles and things like that. 
the academics in a finished school day, so they have their language arts just like we do, history, math, and science. The languages taught formally in the schools are Finnish, Swedish, and English, and the mother tongue. And this was the part that was so incredibly beautiful to me. So especially in Oulu, at the school that had high diversity, if you come in speaking Chinese, and no one in the school speaks Chinese, they will find someone in the community to come and make sure you are continually progressing in your own mother tongue for three hours every week. And that was, I thought, and, they, and we asked them about that, and they said, well, we want our students to remain strong in their own languages, not just grow and finish. Same thing with religion. One hour a week is required for everyone, and the country's, uh, the state religion is Lutheranism. If you don't want to go to Lutheran class, you can go to a um, moral and ethics um, class. And if you're if you are if you're Muslim, for example, your religion will be represented and taught by someone who is Muslim. Same thing if you're Buddhist or Hindu, they will find somebody who will come in for that one hour a week. Woodwork and metalwork was common. Uh, they would make sauna ladles, metal hooks, birdhouses, all kinds of fun things. And lunchtime was just the most wonderful. <laughs> and my husband and I would sit in there for the entire lunch period because we were so amazed. First of all, they would always have homemade bread. Um, then they would have flowers on the tables and, and just the environment. You can see all the windows and it was a very welcoming environment. And I was at the second school when it finally dawned on me how quiet lunchtime was. And so I'd turn on my audio recorder and I'd say, this is lunchtime with the room packed. And it was just quiet. And it's because they have already had recess three times before lunch <laughs> even happens. Whereas our students are bouncing off the walls because they, they've had no breaks outside yet. Um, it was just a, a remarkable, remarkable situation. These pictures are from the country school. That's my husband sitting in the desk. Um, this country school is small enough that they didn't have a cafeteria, so food was brought to the classroom, and they all have their little washcloths to um, get ready for lunch. Here's the country school, so you can see it's typical Finland. They, this is a sauna down on the bottom of the property near the lake. Um, this is the school, 62, 52 children, and here's one of their art labs or sewing labs and that these were their buses leaving the school um, to go home each day and here is Becky's turn. Maybe you should tell me what button you're pushing. This one. Okay. So as I said I didn't travel as much in Finland but um, I have a few pictures here that of Helsinki this is a famous <coughs> Lutheran just beautiful building and this is where the education department is at the um, University of Helsinki. I met with a couple math education profs there. You know, over on the right side. This one, okay. And these are a couple of schools I visited, upper secondary schools in Helsinki. Um, this one, normal licensing, they both are Swedish speaking schools, so I could kind of understand what was going on. This one's right downtown, and this one's more in a, a neighborhood. Uh, then I, in Vanta, Finland, where I stayed, I actually stayed in this apartment building. And there's a lot of apartment buildings there and very tall pines. And uh, I, went, I visited a school in, in Vanta. This was the Finnish speaking school I went to. And thankfully, I could still tell what they were doing. Um, they were using, in, in the math class I went to, they were uh, measuring how high these trees were with uh, plastic clinometers and trigonometry. So that was interesting. So they were outside doing that. Um, by the way, in the, uh, the upper secondary schools, they don't take their shoes off, so they leave their shoes on. But I did notice in Sweden, elementary school, they take their shoes off there too, so that was kind of cute. Becky, what's a clinometer? Oh, it's it's just got a protractor and a, a weighted string, so you can measure an angle. Like something you look for a straw, you, you can make them yourself, so yeah. It's a math, little math tool. Um, this is in Sweden, my friend Ava Buster is a rector, that's a principal at this particular gymnasium. And I was there for a week visiting. Uh, one interesting thing compared to one thing you said, we're kind of I'm learning as I listen to her, we you know, haven't heard our presentation. 
that there were a number of immigrants in Sweden. There, there's more immigrants in Sweden than Finland, but that they're growing in Finland. Um, and I went to some of the math courses for those students, and they were really pushing Swedish. And some of those students were better at English than Swedish. And so they thought it was so exciting. I was there, and they wanted to talk to me, and they kept saying, no, 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 no English, no English. So it was kind of, I didn't really ask, what are you doing with their language? But I don't think they're teaching them their language. So, interesting. I had never seen that before. Yeah. This is supposed to look like a stack of books. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, yeah, here's the elementary school I went to in Sweden. And they also, I didn't take pictures of kids because I didn't, didn't know, you know what permission would be needed then for using those. But here is, again, an example of where they ate lunch. Mm -hmm. And just oh, very nice. pretty settings and nice. Mm -hmm. And then here's the school. And the, the mother of the Swedish, um, Marina Hannes, is here at the seminary. And She's in special ed. Okay, so just a few things, um, some comparisons that I made between, uh, between the countries. Uh, both countries use this first name basis. The, sec the master's degree we already mentioned um, in their subject in the secondary schools. I think that. That's not my mic here. Um, one real important difference is the practice teaching and the teacher prep in Finland, which is different than in Sweden. It's longer, and they have special training schools. Although, this is something that Sweden is proposing to change, and it might be happening even now because it's been a while since I've been there. But they only require a bachelor's degree as here. And it is not a popular profession. Every teacher I met in Sweden said they had poor respect. They were blamed for all of society's problems, which is what you kind of hear teachers feel like here. Um, so it's just so such an interesting difference, even though the two countries have a lot of similarities. Um, in the upper secondary schools, they weren't sent out for a recess every 45 minutes, but they were allowed free and wandering around for at least 15 minutes. There were long breaks between classes. And the teachers were all in the lounge having coffee. And the students could just be socializing and kind of having a nice break. So I thought that was interesting. Um, as I said before, in Sweden, it's, it's even more free and open because it's like a community college. And then the vocational path in Finland is impressive. 40% or more choosing that route um, and so that not thinking they have to go on to a university. Whereas here in the US, you know, it's so encouraged everybody should go to college. And some of us realize that sometimes not everybody should. Um, in Sweden, again, those choices are right at the, at the same school. Um, a few things about math and science at, in the Finnish schools. I don't know how we're doing on time here. Um, the teachers that I met, or the schools where I went, the teachers moved with the students for two or three years, which was interesting. So they really got to know their students. Um, they also had a new subject to teach every year, and then they would start repeating that again in two or three years. Um, and then they also mostly taught in two subject areas, math and chemistry, math and computer science, math and physics. And when I said to them, well, in the US, we often will teach the same subject every year and probably just teach math, and their reaction was, that sounds kind of boring. <laughs> <laughs> Strong emphasis on problem solving, de-emphasis on memory work. They all have a math and science reference book that they use throughout upper secondary school. And they can also use it on this high stakes test they take at the end, which is is an important test for getting into the university. These tests, by the way, are hand graded. They are not multiple choice. They show your work and, and get it graded that way. The math courses are shorter. Um, and they have small little books that they use. They're not lugging around a heavy book all year. And in the upper secondary school, there's either a six or 10 course sequence. You would go with the 10 if you're interested in science or math. And the equity issue, one way that I saw that was there's no tracking anywhere except possibly in ninth grade, which is the last compulsory year. 
and that's just depending on it. Some schools have it, some don't, and if you are more interested in math and science in, as you're going to continue on, that you possibly would choose a more advanced math course at that point. But it's totally the student choice, not the school making that choice for them. Um, a little bit about assessment. This matriculation exam, the ME, is the only standardized assessment used in Finland. It occurs at the end of the 12th grade, the end of uh, upper secondary school. The teachers did um, express to me that they felt some stress about that test, but not because they had to compare well with other teachers or other schools, but they wanted to really prepare their students well because it's a difficult test. The student can choose different, they have to take part of it in their mother tongue, and then they can choose a few of the subjects that they're gonna focus on. Um, the only other assessments that I read about in Finland are statistically designed sampling just to see, well, how are we doing on our core curriculum? But it's anonymous, it's not like, oh, this school is not doing well, we're gonna take funding away from that school, which makes a lot of sense, right, when you're not doing well. Um, or, or we're gonna fire this teacher because of this test. Those kinds of things just are not there at all. And there was an article in um, the NCTM mathematics teacher just shortly before I went about how much they use formative assessment within the classrooms. Uh, all right. Next. Okay, and then just really quick, we'll spend like one minute yeah, on those last two really slides. Yeah, we're running out of time. Um, so what I learned, because I had attended so many conferences before going, they, Finland really did live up to all the hype I learned about um, all of the great things they do. Uh, one of the things I'm working on right now is a strong comparison between response to intervention here in the U.S. with what special education is in Finland. 64% uh, 60, of students in Finland receive some kind of special education support through their schooling. So I knew it, it could not be the same as what our special ed looks like because we're more along the lines of 11%. But what I found is it's basically like our tiered approach before students would end up in special <laughs> education. There, that's, they call that part special education. So I'm continuing work on that. Um, culture does play a big role, so we know a lot of Finland is homogenous, but the schools that had great heterogeneity in Oulu and Helsinki were still producing strong results. So they have a very high Somali population. After Minnesota, Somali being the highest Somali population, Minnesota, Stockholm, Sweden, and then Helsinki, Finland is the, um, the, the largest uh, amounts of Somali people. We believe um, that here in Minnesota, we can start to implement some of the principles. Um, I just learned of a, one of our state representatives who also spent time in Finland, and he had set up a meeting with our commissioner, Brenda Casilius. so I'm hoping to do some work with the two of them to see what are some small things that we could start to implement in our K-12 schools. And personally, this is my family tree, and this is at about a 10-point font. And I'm pointing to my name. This tree stopped being created in 19, on the wall, it stopped being created in 1974. I guess I'm giving my age a little bit here. Um, but that was amazing to see it still featured in a public library in northern, in northern Finland. Um, it just meant the world to me to see that. And this is where I stayed. This is my grandmother's property. And we got an amazing sauna every single night. Um, it was just fabulous. <laughs> Yeah, so the biggest difference that I found between Finland, Sweden, and the U.S. is this um, trust and respect issue. And so how we can try to change that here is, is a big question. Um, and an article I found, and then I also referenced some things that Louise Wilson worked on. She had a sabbatical the same semester as me. That in the U.S., and then this is what I found in Sweden, a big article in the paper, of, um, by some of the key education leaders in Sweden is that they are beginning, and we are beginning, to increase entrance and completion requirements for our teacher prep programs and trying to um, extend the training time to longer than just a, that, well, what we call student teaching for just one semester. And like um, Katie just said, Minnesota, it's often compared to Finland in size and population and that, you know, 
we do have the ability to do some yeah. things as a, at a state level, and we it certainly could make okay. some changes. So, and maybe the next slide. Um, this is my personal thing. When I was done with um, a month of visiting schools, I did some exploring, and my husband, they don't show very well here, and my son joined me at the end, and we explored some of his family tree um, areas as well. So, so Pitoxia Pollion, <laughs> All right, and I apologize that we're right at the end, but are there any questions that you have for us? Did you find that there were less behavior problems overall in both elementary and secondary? Did you I did notice a difference between Finland and Sweden. Sweden was more like here. I've been in classrooms here because I've supervised student teachers, and I used to teach in the secondary level. And yeah, yeah. And I was specifically observing for that. My presentation today did not focus on special education, but I was looking for behaviors and very, very limited. I mean, when 45 minutes, if you get to go outside and play, you get to go and play and let all that energy out. And I didn't do research on that, but I was anecdotally collecting information. So I think a lot of that, again, is that respect issue that made a difference in them. All right, well, thank you very much for coming to our presentation. We're grateful to have you all here.